afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to ITM University's Acoustic Sound Imaging Webinar. Uh, my name is Chris Doran. I am a Technical Sales Specialist here at ITM Instruments. Uh, I'll be joined uh, today by Adam St. Clair. Adam is an Industrial Imaging Category Manager with Fluke. He's been with Fluke for about eight years in sev several different roles uh, from factory and in the field. He's currently part of the Industrial Imaging Business Unit, working to launch new industrial imaging technology into the industrial space. I'll be turning the, uh, the presentation over to Adam uh, shortly. Uh, just a reminder, please uh, mute yourselves throughout the presentation. Um, Adam will be sharing a PowerPoint presentation, um, and that'll happen shortly. Uh, also, for any and all questions, please use the chat feature, which is in the uh, lower hand corner on your toolbox on the right hand side. Uh, we'll be fielding questions throughout the presentation uh, and I will turn it over to Adam. Adam, take it away. Right on. Thanks, Chris. And hello to everyone. Chris, just give me a, a quick sanity check here. Can you can you see my screen? Yes, sir. We can all see your screen. Right on. All right. Well, let's get into it. Um, everybody on the phone, uh, thanks for thanks for joining us this morning, this afternoon, depending on where you're at. Excited to to spend a little bit of time sharing some some new technology with you, um, and, and also answering your questions. So I I do want this to be. Uh, a blend of, of both uh, kind of presentation and, and interaction. So what I will do is is, is stop every every few slides or so uh, and just answer any questions so so we can have as much context as possible. Uh, so to kick us off, I'll, I'll just level set with 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 what I hope to get out of the the hour from a presentation standpoint. And like I said, uh, your questions are are super important. So let's make sure we're allowing enough time for that. So we'll we'll start with what is acoustic imaging? It's, it's, it's a new technology, so I want to spend a little bit of time just making sure um, you all leave here with an understanding of the capabilities of the technology and how it works. Uh, we'll also talk specifically about the Fluke II-900 and, and how to operate the, the tool. Talk about some of the practical considerations for you. So this is a, a pretty interesting part of the, of the content here. Uh, and then, and then we'll also spend a little bit of time on the leak estimation and reporting, so uh, additional functionality of the tool, and then finish with the application examples. So uh, the application examples are not by far, uh, they're not everything that this tool could do, but I think it's a good representation of some of the ways that, that we've found our customers are, are using this tool to add value uh, for their applications. So, uh, let's get into it and uh, I look forward to, to getting your guys' questions and interactions as well. All right, so what is acoustic imaging? Essentially, essentially what the technology does is it turns it turns a sound into a picture. So you've got you've got um, kind of a similar to thermal imaging where where this allows us to see things that we wouldn't otherwise hear. And so, so what you can do with acoustic imaging is you can scan an area where sounds are coming from. Um, okay, so this is a, a view of the front of the Fluke I-900. The, the gray part is the, uh, the sensor head, which has 64 microphones. Those microphones are listening to anything in front of the camera uh, at a distance of about 125 feet. So, uh, they're they're picking up on sounds with within two to 52 kilohertz anywhere right in front of you to to 125 feet away and then in the center of that sensor head you've got a visible light camera so just like a, a camera you would have on your phone or you know your regular point and shoot camera and what that turns into is uh, a visible light picture of a scene with the sound overlaid on top of it. So here's a look at the face button on the far right is the is the uh, button that allows you to capture either images or videos of uh, a leak that you found or any type of uh, sound anomaly that you found. That information is is captured, uh, and you've got you've got a seven inch LCD display to really kind of give you a big view of what's going on in your environment or your facility or your industry. The only other the only other button that's on the front there is the power button. So uh, pretty simplistic use and then the rest of the rest of the operation is done through through the touchscreen. 
So that's really uh, kind of a, a quick overview of what acoustic imaging is. I know it sounds kind of simple when you when you summarize it like that, but um, really this technology is 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 extremely intuitive. So um, folks without extensive training or background of of sound imaging or ultrasonic can pick this tool up and go find leaks in a in a facility very quickly. So uh, very, very limited if any training needed. Uh, so it sounds simple because it is. All right, let's talk a little bit about the the operation of the unit. So um, I already I already went through the, the two buttons, the hard buttons, you've got the opportunity to, to save an image or a video, uh, and then an on off switch. And then the rest, like I said, let me show you our menu options or what the user interface would look like. So when you turn on the camera, you've got you've got some menu options on the left, and let's start on the left and just kind of read left to right. So uh, the menu bar that appears on the left is all of the different menu areas you can get into. So if you were to select image, that would allow you to change images, videos, or what's called leak quantification. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. The memory button, just like your phone, uh, you, you click on memory and it will take you to a library of all of the images that you've stored on the device. The acoustics menu allows you to, to make some adjustments to uh, the decibel levels that you're picking up on and kind of fine tune the unit for your specific applications. Palettes will allow you to change the colors that the, the sounds are represented by. Uh, markers is uh, is what you see right in the middle of the screen there. So the markers menu option allows you to turn that on and off or enable or disable it. And really what that's doing is allowing you to uh, quantify the decibel level of the sound that you're visualizing on the camera. And then finally settings that will allow you to change things like the, you know, the time, the date, uh, the, the unit. So if you want to use metric or imperial uh, and change some of the, the different settings like that. Uh, finally, you've got uh, on the bottom here, you've got general info that'll tell you, you know, date, time and, and battery life. Uh, center reading, we already went through that. And then on the right hand side is the, the frequency range and also the band that you are visualizing sounds within. So you see the little, you see the little circles on the top left hand side of the yellow box and the bottom right hand side. You can expand and contract that box on the touch screen there and you can also slide it up and down. And what this is doing is it's, it's telling the camera what, what frequency band to visualize sound within. And why that's useful is you may be in a really noisy environment, noisy to our ears, uh, but a lot, of the, a lot of the compressed air and vacuum and, and gas leaks are happening at a much higher frequency. So what you can do is you can adjust the frequency to a tighter band and, and, and move the scale up and you're essentially eliminating all the sounds that we're hearing from the from the camera and just focusing on the, the frequency ranges that are outside of what we can hear. And so it allows you to continue to use this tool in uh, what is a really noisy environment for us. All right, this is a, just a, a quick view of the, the different modes that we already talked about, right? Switching between images and video, going into your memory, changing your color palette. So whatever's easier for your eye to pick up on or for, for those of us that are uh, colorblind and do better with a grayscale, that's an option as well. Um, the, the markers, uh, looking at the quantification of the decibel level, if that's important to you, you can turn that on and off. All right, so now let's get into to some of the practical considerations. And this will give you a feel for how this camera operates in out in the factory or out in the field. So one of the things that you've got to be mindful of when using this device is something called reflections. So what you're looking for when you're out scanning for a leak is you're looking for these targets and these targets that that show up on the screen and they stay on the screen. If they pop in and out, those are really just uh, those are just echoes. Uh, or sound bouncing off of you know different surfaces and appearing on the screen, but they're not actually leaks unless you see a target that that stays on the screen. But what you can get is what you can get is a reflection of a sound. So the sound 
kind of has an, an origin or a source and that sound emits and then it will bounce off or, or hit a surface and appear to be a leak even if it's not. So you've got this sequence of images from A to F and I'll just kind of logically walk you through what I'm thinking when I'm out uh, in a facility looking for a compressed gas or air leak uh, and, and then we'll watch a video of this same thing happening. So I'm in, in, in image A, I've got my II-900, I'm scanning an area where I believe there could be leaks and I see a target. But the first thing that I see is that, okay, it's, it's, on, a, it's on a hose, like that, that makes sense. It could be, it could be that, the, that that leak is on that hose. Um, but then I move a little bit closer and move to the right a little bit and I see that that target moves. And now that target is right on top of a concrete floor. That doesn't make sense. So when I move, if the target moves, it's telling me that it's likely a reflection. Um, and then as I as I continue to move um, down and around the area where the target is, uh, I'm able to pinpoint that it's actually coming from a compression fitting on the nozzle uh, of the compressed air hose. So let me let me show you the video of that happening, and and it's really kind of just walking through what I just explained. All right, so you see it. Now I move around to the right. The target's on the, in the center of the floor, but that doesn't make sense, but I know there's something close. I tilt the camera back up and I see that the leak is actually coming from that compression fitting. All right, so I saw a reflection. I moved left and right. I saw that target move. It told me that there was something in the area, um, but it, it wasn't the spot that I originally identified. So that's, that's how reflections show up on the camera. All right, now let me show you another example where you see echoes. So this is this is different sounds within the environment that I'm in that are that are being picked up by the camera but aren't actually leaks. So when I hit play on this video, what I want you to see is you've got different kind of blobs of color popping up on the screen, but they're not actually that target uh, that target view like we saw when we actually identified a leak. So this is me just kind of scanning an area where there's likely to be leaks and honing in on the, the actual source of the leak and ignoring all of the echoes and reflections. So this is just an example of how you would kind of move around a facility to pinpoint the area where a leak is. So I see there's likely stuff that I need to go find. Not exactly sure of where it is. I think I know in this view. Uh, but I'm going to move around to the left and get a different angle on this spot to to make sure that it's the right area that I need to that I need to go fix the leak. So I move around to the other side of it. I see those echoes and reflections. I continue to move, and actually, it's that center that center spot. All right. Now here's 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 another here's another Thing to consider when when you're out scanning for leaks with the II-900, just kind of run it through the sanity check. So you've got this you've got this picture here uh, on the on the far left hand side of the screen, and you've got a target that's steady. Um, so it, there's definitely something to to figure out there. Um, but it, it wouldn't make sense that there's some sort of air leak right in the middle of a, a piece of steel. So again, this is just how you would practically use the tool when you find when you find an area of interest. So I see, I see something there, but I elevate, I get up and over, and even without direct line of sight to that compressed airline, uh, I, see that, I see that echo, uh, and I'm able to then kind of run it through the sanity check, realize, okay, it's not, the leak is not coming from steel, so I need to elevate, I need to move up or around uh, to actually identify where the leak is. But, What's, what's cool about this example is it demonstrates how you don't necessarily need direct line of sight in all situations to be able to understand where you should or could go identify an actual lead. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause there for, for just a second, Chris. Are there, are there any questions that have popped up that are worth uh, taking on right now? And nothing's come in so far. I'll just remind everyone that uh, you can uh, type your questions in and we will take them in uh, as they come. Uh, there's going to be plenty of uh, plenty of information already and plenty more to come. So please don't hesitate to ask. 
Uh, Adam, if I see any anything coming in the next uh, 30 seconds or a minute, I'll uh, interrupt you and, uh, and let you know. Yeah, yeah, please do. I, I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the questions are getting answered when we're reviewing certain parts of the of the material. Um, so there's as much context as possible. So, um, okay, so let's let's keep rolling here. So this is uh, this is some noise. So we've got uh, an image capture here where you've got a bunch of different kind of areas on the screen where colors are popping up. Um, but but what I want to what I want to communicate to to you all here is that we're we're not seeing we're not seeing the targets uh, that we have seen in the other examples where there's actually been leaks. So you are going to get noise on the image, uh, regardless of what environment you're in. Um, you want to make sure you can distinguish between these just blobs without the full color palette and the actual circular targets, what are which are going to be representative of the leaks. Okay, so what's on the screen here is all just noise. And then the the other the other practical consideration we already talked about, uh, which is in in environments where you're getting a lot of noise, one way to eliminate that is by adjusting either the the level or span of the frequency range that you're visualizing sound within. So either shrinking that that range or moving that range up and down. And one one other thing that you can do as well, uh, and I would actually recommend this, is is once you've once you've kind of got a feel for the specific types of leaks that you're looking for, once you've got a feel for what frequency range those happen within, um, getting a tighter band will allow the camera to be more sensitive. So if you have a really a really loose or wide band. Uh, some of those some of those smaller leaks aren't going to be as easy to visualize. So the tighter band you have, uh, the more likely you are going to be able to identify some of the smaller leaks in your applications. All right, here's a, a, a you don't have to read all of this. Um, let me just walk you through it. This is a this is a comparison of the II-900 acoustic imager versus some of the conventional ultrasonic tools that have been used in the past for the same application. So an, a, lot of, a lot of folks are familiar with or have used ultrasonic leak detection tools where you've got you know, a microphone and you've got headphones and you've got um, a, a decibel level, kind of like a severity scale or meter uh, in your hand. And, and what, what that workflow looks like is really um, scanning an area point by point and listening with a long range sensor for what a tr somebody trained to know what a, a, a compressed air or compressed gas leak sounds like and, and scanning point by point listening for those anomalies. And then once you and once you've got an area isolated uh, where you suspect there to be a leak, you would then swap out that sensor head for um, uh, a closer range or pinpoint type sensor head to identify where exactly that leak is coming from. Uh, and then typically what we've seen uh, with, with our customers is there would be some sort of manual tag. You would write it down and, and either create a PM or uh, just create a, a list of different areas for fixing leaks to then give to a third party contractor to come out and fix them. So that's kind of that, that workflow. And some of the studies that, that we did to understand the timing around that is identifying a, a single leak, verifying it, validating it, and then um, capturing it um, or reporting it takes takes about 20 minutes um, for, for a trained person to, to get through scanning a large area, pinpointing, and then marking that leak. Uh, what, yeah. What, uh, yeah. Sorry, I saw a few, uh, few questions coming in, if you don't mind. No, that's great. Okay, so first question I, I see here is the line of sight, it's a line of sight question. Can you see compressed air leaks behind drywall? No, I, I don't think you would. Uh, not on not on um, a solid piece of drywall. So, I mean, if there was a seam with an air gap in between, uh, which, uh, you know, you don't typically see in drywall, um, you, you may be able to see something there. Uh, I have seen some examples where, you know, there's been like a uh, uh, an air void in a panel with the uh, compressed air regulators, and we were able to identify that there was some leaks going on behind there. 
Um, but when you've got a solid panel or a solid sheet of drywall, uh, you, you're not going to be able to see through that. That's perfect. Thank you. A couple more. Uh, do you have any tips for what frequencies uh, leaks will happen? At? Yeah, so they 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 are specific based on a few different variables: uh, the pressure, the the size and shape of the orifice, and the medium. So if it's compressed air or if it's some some sort of compressed gas. Um, so, so it really is application specific, um, but what I typically do when I'm out in a facility for the first time just scanning for, for leaks is I'll set the frequency range between 17 and 24 kilohertz, and that gives me, that give, put, usually puts me in the best spot to, to identify most leaks. Now, let me, I'm going to flip back and show you uh, one other thing really quick. Um, to answer this question. So you see, uh, you see, even if we've, so in this example here, the green box in the frequency range is showing that we're visualizing everything between 35 and 50 kilohertz, right? Uh, but if I'm, if I'm out using this imager, even though I'm isolated to that frequency band for visualization, I can also see the amplitude in the other frequency ranges. So what I would recommend is starting with a band between 17 and 24 kilohertz to visualize, but then keeping an eye at the amplitude of the other frequency ranges that I'm not visualizing. And if I see a spike, just quickly moving that band to see if there's anything that I'm, that I'm missing. So hopefully that makes sense. That's perfect. And actually that answers uh, the third question that came in as well. A reminder folks, you can chat in your question. Uh, if it's relevant to what Alan's talking about, or even if it's not, I will chime in and get them to answer them uh, on the fly as well. We'll also be uh, having questions at the end of the presentation. Adam, it's all yours. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, for that. thanks, Chris, and thank you guys for the questions. It's nice to get a little break from the, the presentation. I know that gets a little monotonous, so thank you. Okay, so we talked about we talked about the conventional workflow and, and the the time that it would take for a trained person to to go through and identify where a leak is and then document that. Now, what what makes the II nine hundred so impactful is the the ability to scan a large area at a distance uh, and and even see multiple leaks within uh, within the field of view. So as opposed to you know scanning a large area with a with one sensor head and then uh, pinpointing and changing a sensor head to actually be able to pinpoint uh, and then documenting with a tag and then you know writing that down and communicating your findings to either another member of the team or like I said to a third party, uh, you're able to you're able to find the leaks a lot quicker from a further distance away with an untrained person and then capture that image to share with the rest of the team or an, uh, an external team uh, just by pushing a button and downloading a picture. So that workflow and all of the, and all of the uh, studies, time studies that we did, um, we're, we're able to find multiple leaks, or in this case, two leaks in a quarter of the time. So I think the opportunity here is really you know, putting a putting a really intuitive, easy to use tool in a hand in the hands of somebody that's untrained, really, uh, and and giving them the opportunity or the ability to get out and start finding leaks in a noisy environment right away, and then easily documenting those findings to get out and and do the repairs when it makes sense. This is kind of a a look at the traditional versus uh, the new technology and, and how that shows up in the in the common workflows. All right, so here's questions that I get all the time, uh, and I and I just want to make sure I'm I'm explicit about about where we're at with these application spaces. So, Corona discharge is something that folks want to do in certain applications. Uh, and, and with the II-900, we are able to visualize some of the partial discharge um, applications. And it just has to do with the, the sensitivity of the, of the II-900. So we are able to visualize some, but not all of the corona discharge or partial discharge applications. Uh, and this tool in particular was not uh, specifically designed for that application. So it will see some, but not all. If that is the application that is most important to you, 
um, I would I would recommend uh, I would recommend waiting a couple of months. Um, we are working on some technology to better address this application space. Um, so just an application watch out there. Uh, the other the other question that I get all of the time is about refrigerant leaks. And so this and, and I've mentioned it already before, uh, the ability for this tool to pick up on on other types of gases. It's not just compressed air. Um, but with with uh, the compressed gases, I mean, if you think about uh, a compressed air leak versus a gas leak, I mean, the, a gas leak at, at the, the size of a normal compressed air leak is a pretty big leak. Um, so this this II-900 is not sensitive enough to replace a sniffer or those refrigerant detectors that are that are picking up on leaks in the parts per million spectrum. Um, this will the II-900 will detect big leaks, and we have absolutely been out in facilities detecting you know leaks on argon bottles, nitrogen bottles, CO2 in production lines, natural gas leaks. We have. We absolutely have picked up on, identified, and, and helped customers solve those problems. Um, but if you're looking for this to replace a sniffer, absolutely not. It's not sensitive enough. And I know that there's some applications, uh, you know, whether it's it's safety or um, some sort of protocol that that you need to 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 sign off on on a regular basis. Uh, this is not intended to replace that tool. So I want just want to stress those things. Uh, I get those questions a lot. So, so keep those things in mind. All right. Now here's some of the other frequent, frequently asked questions. Um, I, I got, uh, I, I said earlier in the presentation about how far uh, you could be away from a leak and detect it. Uh, I said 125 feet. The actual spec is 164 feet when you have direct line of sight. So the reason I said 125 feet is just to be a little bit more conservative and all of the times and all of the experience that I've had out in factories and facilities looking for leaks, uh, direct line of sight is not something that I, that I commonly have. And so um, I, I get a little bit more conservative when I'm making a broader statement about the camera's ability to detect leaks at a distance. So the spec would say 164 feet, that's when you have direct line of sight. How many pictures can it store? Um, up to a, up to a thousand images on the device. You've also got the ability to export the images onto your computer and save them that way. Um, so really, not much of a limitation there as far as capturing images and videos. Battery lasts for about six hours. Obviously, those things are uh, dependent upon you know, how many videos you're taking or pictures you're taking, or if you've got the backlight all the way up, um, but in kind of the worst case scenario, six hours is, is the spec. So Fluke tends to spec things on the conservative side, worst case scenario. Um, so I've, you know, I've been out in the field with a lower backlight, only doing images, not videos, and got more, more than six hours, uh, but this is kind of that conservative worst case scenario spec. And then finally, we've already we've already kind of touched on this, but just to reiterate, I get asked all the time, can can I see more than just compressed air leaks? So this camera is not picking up on air; it's picking up on sound, right? So you anything that's making a sound uh, within two to fifty-two kilohertz over a certain level of sensitivity, you're going to be able to visualize. So that's vacuum leaks, steam leaks, other gas leaks, absolutely. Uh, if they're within that that frequency range and meet uh, a certain level of, of sensitivity from a from a sound perspective, so it's not about compressed air. Uh, that's just what most of the the customers that we've talked to are using it for. Uh, there's there's a whole host of other applications that this is going to be well suited for. All right, um, another another. Thing that this tool can do that's been uh, that's been utilized quite a bit by our customers is the leak estimation feature. So, um, kind of going back to the operation of the camera, there is an option when you when you select the image button in the menu uh, to go into what's called leak queue mode. And what happens then is you've got a circle that appears in the center of the screen, 
And if you position a leak within the center of the screen, it's going to capture both the distance and what's called a leak Q scale. Uh, that's really just looking at the, the decibel the decibel reading and the distance at the uh, at the same time running it through an algorithm and then popping out a value. Um, when you capture an image of a leak within the circle in leak queue mode, uh, you're then able to to estimate the cost of that leak. So then you would take that you would take that image file and you would put it into our online report generator and you would you would put in some some variables you know like what the pressure is of that specific line um, what type of gas it is um, and the energy costs for that specific uh, compressor you would put in some of those some of those variables and then what, what would pop out is the cost per year so on the right hand side of the screen you see an actual example of uh, what the report output would look like. You would have a picture of that leak, uh, and then you would say, have it say, you know, what type of gas it is, what the leak Q rate was, and the decibel level, the the PSI of the system, and the uh, estimated leak rate, and then it would actually give you a cost per year. So in this specific case, for this one leak, uh, it would cost $225 a year if it went uh, unaddressed. I've seen leaks. Uh, that would cost up in the thousands, and in most facilities, uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of, of leaks, especially, especially those compressed air intensive facilities. And most of the leaks that I see in facilities are actually downstream of the compressor. So you'll see quite a, quite a few leaks at the compressor, and I'll show you some application examples of that. Uh, but most of the leaks are found downstream. So what, what, what this leak estimation or, or quantification allows you to do is one, create a report to communicate your findings. And, uh, and then it also allows you to quantify your findings and, and really kind of understand whether or not that specific leak is one that, you, that you're going to prioritize higher than other PM needs that you have. Because I know, I know most of you are all 100% busy. You're not looking for things to do. Uh, you're looking for what's the most important thing to do. And this functionality in the tool can help you help you answer that question. All right, before I get into application examples, Chris, do we got any any burning questions before I before I go through these? Uh, we've had quite a few come in. Let me go back up here. Uh, we did have a follow up on the drywall question. Uh, if the leak yeah. is behind the wall or on the surface, will we still see it or won't we see it? Read that one more time to me, please. If the leak is either behind the wall or on the surface, the question is, we still won't see it? We still won't see the leak? It's, uh, I'm assuming yeah. it, 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 the question is more surrounding uh, if the, this probably has to do with um, with the uh, surrounding uh, surrounding noise and anything maybe surface noise that's reflecting uh, reflecting noise maybe uh, based on the surface. But yeah, and maybe and maybe we need to connect with this individual um, separately, and I, and I'm happy to do that. Um, but but I'll take a crack at it. So so the the camera is not able to see to see through anything. So. Um, drywall is a, is a good barrier for sound, um, it, at least the, at the level and that the camera would need to be able to pick up and, and identify and pinpoint a leak. Um, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to visualize anything behind a solid surface. Uh, you would have to get, you would have to get either direct line of sight or get to a point where there was some free, free airflow. Uh, to be able to to pick up on that sound. So if there if there's more to be desired there, um, absolutely happy to have a, a more in depth and, and specific application. So so sorry if that doesn't get you home, um, but let's continue the conversation if necessary. Perfect. I believe there's a follow up uh, down below. I'll just go. Uh, can this can the unit be used for electrical arcing? In, in some cases, yes. So we have we have visualized um, a lot of a lot of electrical arcing applications. The only the only kind of watch out there is that some some of the electrical arcing applications or discharge applications 
uh, are require a higher level of sensitivity that this camera uh, is not built for or designed for? So the answer is some, but not all. Perfect. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, next, we will go to uh, can it pick up noise from defective contract contactors or breakers? Yeah, I have seen a couple examples of that, um, and and again, it'll just kind of it'll just kind of depend on on how much sound that's creating uh, and at what frequency range. I have seen some of it. Um, it wasn't it wasn't tested rigorously for for that specific application, but I have seen some examples from our field engineers of that application. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, last, before we continue, um, regarding the leak detection, do you input the system information before you take the measurement, or will and will it work on a saved file? So so you enter all of the variables after you capture the image so so no you do not enter all that information before you capture the image and what you what you then can do is you can take all of the stored images that you have if they're in the leak queue mode so so when you're in image mode it literally captures an image a screen capture in a jpeg there's no data behind it when you go into leak queue mode you're capturing not only the the, the image, uh, but all of the data behind it, the decibel level, the distance, uh, and all of the other data that's being captured. So if you've captured an image in leak queue mode, it creates an AS2 file. And then at any point, uh, you can take those AS2 files, plug in, uh, plug in the different system variables, and have it output uh, an estimation of the cost for that leak. So no, you don't have to input the variables beforehand. Yes, you can, you can um, run any of the existing or saved images that you have through the, the leak estimator uh, as long as they, they were captured in leak queue mode. That's perfect. Thank you, Adam. I believe the follow-up, uh, I have a follow-up from the previous uh, question earlier. Um, it based on detecting leaks behind certain types of materials that are not in your direct line of sight. Maybe listing materials that may you may or may not uh, be able to uh, detect through. Although I, you know, I know you covered uh, that it won't actually be through, but uh, I believe that's the follow up from earlier. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll just reiterate, uh, it's not able to see through anything or listen through anything. Uh, you would either need direct line of sight or a spot where there's free airflow. Uh, and even then the, the camera's ability to pick up on it would be, would be greatly compromised. So for best, the best results, direct line of sight uh, is needed. Anything else would likely just be a reflection and indicate that you would need to either, you know, cut that drywall open or open that panel or get a different angle that would allow you to, to have more direct line of sight. So I, I think really the, the bottom line is um, you, you, need, you need direct line of sight to be able to accurately pinpoint uh, a leak. Anything else that the camera picks up on uh, without direct line of sight would just be a likely indication that there's something, that there's something there uh, worth worth investigating further but with any accuracy to say for certain that there's a leak uh you would or to to pinpoint the location of it uh you you would need you would need direct line of sight fantastic okay two more questions before we go back to the presentation uh first yeah. can the device be used to measure sudden pressure changes by uh, example delayed ignition i'm not i'm not familiar I'm not familiar enough with that specific workflow. Uh, we may need to connect you with uh, one of our, our application engineers and, and happy to do that uh, if it makes sense. Um, the, the output, let me, let me tell you what I do know. The output or the, the quantification is in decibels. So we would be able to pick up on a sound change and quantify a sound change as it, as it relates to pressure 
Um, but tying but tying that sound back to a specific PSI or bar value uh, is not something that we're able to do with this camera. Perfect. Thank you, Adam. Last question before we go. Can the police department use uh, this type of unit uh, to monitor the level of noise uh, from motorbikes or motorcycles? Oh, that's interesting. My dad's actually a policeman, so um, maybe we'll maybe we'll have to get out in the field and try that. Um, no, what you what you get is when you get a decibel level. Uh, you you would get uh, an average decibel reading for all of the sound in the field of view. Um, so it so it could it could be um, it it could kind of get you going in that direction. And obviously, if you had a threshold uh, of sound, you could you could compare the the value from the camera to that to that threshold to make that determination. My my only hesitation to say yes is that it wouldn't be it the camera would not be able to isolate this the sound specifically from uh, that that motorcycle. So if there was any other sound uh, coming coming into the the focal plane array of the microphones that would influence the value, uh, so isolating that motorcycle would be wouldn't be possible. But um, it may directionally, uh, you know, figure out, may directionally be able to help you understand whether you need to, you know, pull that guy over and have a chat. Perfect. That that's all for now. And, and go. Okay. Awesome. Well, let's get into some application examples. Uh, looks like we've got about 15 minutes left. So. Uh, we'll go through these and really, really, this is just to kind of get the wheels turning uh, and give you guys some insights into some some of the applications that our customers are, are using this for. So we won't go deep dive into the specifics on the applications. I really just want to kind of give you a give you a look at what some of the customers are doing to, to then think about the different opportunities you may have to, to use the tool to, to help you. So. This is uh, some compressed air drop downs at a, at a manufacturing facility. What I, what I love about this image is, um, you know, it just is a, a good representation of, man, you've got a lot of sound, a lot of noise happening in this environment right here. And, you know, this is not, this is not a trained professional out there trying to use um, traditional equipment to find leaks. This is just a point, point the camera in a general area and how quickly and easily you are able to go pinpoint a, a compressed air leak. So this is a compression fitting on a, on a drop down. We see quite a few leaks in, on, on these types of uh, fittings. Here's a, a, a spot I had mentioned earlier. Um, most of the compressed air leaks that we find are downstream of the compressor, uh, but there are opportunities to find leaks and create some savings right at the source. So uh, again, this will impact the efficiency that the that the system is running at um, ultimately compressed air leaks are going to show up in a couple of different ways. The one of the primary ways is the uh, the savings in the kilowatt hours or the, the on savings on the utility bill. So the less air the less air uh, you're leaking out your system, uh, the more efficient your system will be. The less energy it will cost to run that system. The other way that it shows up is in is in quality. So sometimes when you don't have the right amount of pressure to a specific part in a, in a production line or a specific um, kind of sequence in a production line, it can impact quality and productivity. Um, and and a, lot of the, a lot of those things can be cleaned up and fixed by uh, tightening up your, your compressed air systems. Here's a leak on a, on a regulator. So again, this is more kind of at the, at the source. A discharge valve connection. Here's one of those downstream examples um, at, a, at a food and beverage facility. You can take your best guess uh, on where this is at. Um, but again, kind of, a, kind of a cool example of, you know, how easy it is to isolate and pinpoint at a distance. So we didn't, you know, shut production down uh, to go do maintenance or identify where uh, there's opportunity to, to, 
create cost savings or, or quality improvements when we have planned or scheduled downtime. Uh, this was, you know, during production at a glance from a safe distance pinpointing opportunities. This one's kind of hard to see, um, but this is on a, on a boiler tube at a, at a, a natural gas facility. So the, these boiler tubes, um, what, what the customer and I were, were working through here is when, when there was boiler tube leaks, uh, what they used to do what, before they got this tool was they would shut the whole system down. They would connect a compressor to the boiler tube um, network and they would pressurize the lines and then they would send a guy around the, the you know, where all of the tubes were going and have him literally listen for hissing. Uh, and that would, that would take them hours, if not days and several people uh, on it to try and pinpoint these leaks. And so um, with, with the ability to do it um, with a single person and not relying on what our ears can hear, but expanding that frequency range, uh, they were able to cut the, the time to identify these boiler tube leaks uh, into a fraction of what it was before. So kind of tough to see, but that's the story behind the, the picture there. I mentioned the uh, opportunity to see other gases. So here's an example of a natural gas leak. Uh, sometimes you'll smell these, uh, but pinpointing them can be extremely difficult. And if it's outside, um, it can be even harder to, to, to pinpoint with your nose. Uh, so here's an example of something other than compressed air. Uh, this are, so these are, are, are uh, airlines on semi trucks. So a lot of pneumatic uh, needs for the operation of specific equipment. So it's not just in you know, the production of, um, of things that this can be a useful tool, but it can also help in um, you know, the actual equipment that, that is being manufactured to identify um, potential quality um, defects or um, you know, help kind of that production process for, for folks that are, are using pneumatics. There's another uh, non-compressed air application. So an outdoor nitrogen leak, uh, potential safety issue, uh, as well as um, quite a bit higher cost uh, when you're talking about some of these direct cost gases. Ammonia compressor, anybody that's done uh, you know, ammonia compressor um, hunting before. I mean, I've heard some 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 sulfur sticks uh, and some different kind of approaches to finding uh, ammonia leaks. I'm pretty big in the process industry and in food and beverage industry. Um, but uh, an, again, another non-compressed air example of uh, the capabilities of the tool. Argon. Uh, here's a here's a um, an expensive one right here for sure. Um, but the uh, right at the right at the regulator, right at the valve there, um, just seeing you know all of that that paid for argon just leaking right out of the side of the tank. So a big opportunity for cost savings there. Uh, here's another cool one, and this is the the last example I've got. Um, but this is a this is a, a huge duct at a coal plant that's just sucking. Uh, sucking air out of the out of the facility for for safety reasons and just for their production process, um, but this is a this is a uh, an example of a vacuum leak, right? Because it's sucking air through this duct, um, but it had it had pretty serious safety implications for this particular plant. Um, but but a neat example and kind of unconventional uh, example of our customers just figuring out different and unique ways to to use this tool. To help them solve problems. So again, here I think that the I think the idea is that hey, it's not about it's not about gas, it's not about air, it's not about uh, anything other than sound. Like when can sound help you uh, identify a problem or fix or pinpoint a problem? All right, with that we've got uh, we've got eight minutes left. So Chris, I'll uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, and uh, we'll answer any questions that are remaining. All right, uh, folks, I will remind you that uh, you can type in your uh, questions in the chat feature on the uh, bottom. Uh, please take, uh, keep in mind that any questions about price uh, availability through ITM, you can email uh, information at itm.com directly, and our customer service and sales team uh, will direct you to 
uh, the right individual to contact for pricing and availability. Uh, so please, like I said, uh, please use the chat feature for any questions that you may have. I will wait. Uh, we'll wait a few minutes to see them uh, all come in. Also, take this opportunity to thank Adam very much for the presentation. Uh, it was fantastic. I hope uh, I hope it went over uh, everything that uh, that everyone connected uh, could think of. Uh, again, please try and bring out as many questions as you can. And I see a couple coming in now. Uh, would this work for detecting small leaks around Windows? Yes, I have seen I have seen examples of of that working. Um, again, that would be kind of a, a a vacuum type leak that you're looking for. Um, but I have seen I have seen examples of of that working in kind of that residential application space. Perfect. And what about defective bearings on electric motors? Ah, yes. What a cool application. Uh, no, it will not work for that. Um, but it's definitely it's definitely a need that we've identified within the the product development and innovation team. So um, stay tuned, man. That's a that's a really cool application. The mechanical reliability space is something that's on our radar. Uh, but don't buy this tool for that. Okay, perfect. Another question in. Uh, aside from adjusting free, uh, the frequency range, can you add a cone to assist in pinpointing a leak, or does it even matter? Yes, yeah, so I think the I think the question is there, kind of like isolating a specific area. Um, so no, you you cannot you cannot add anything to the sensor head, um, but it also it also is not needed. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, there's 64 microphones, like I mentioned before, and they're all interacting with one another to triangulate the source of the leak. Um, so, so there really isn't a need to isolate any specific area. If it's in the field of view, uh, within the frequency range that we're trying to detect, um, you're gonna be able to pick it up. Thank you very much. Uh, another one coming in. I have seen ultrasonic leak detectors that I have that have tone generator. Uh, this can be put into systems that are shut down. Example: ducting. Yeah. So so go ahead. Uh, go ahead and use use that same signal generator type of equipment. Um, just make sure that it's within that two to 52 kilohertz range, and then the, the IA900 will be able to pick up on it. So the idea there is that, um, you know, if you had like an empty duct or an empty pipe or something like that, could you introduce a sound signal down that shaft or down that tube uh, and be able to pick up on anywhere where that sound escapes? You can absolutely leverage a, a signal generator uh, with in conjunction with this tool. We don't we don't have anything specifically for generating signals, but I have seen customers using uh, different signal generators in conjunction with the IA900 uh, in areas where uh, you know you don't have just like free flowing air or free flowing gas that's going to create that sound. Perfect. So is it safe to assume that uh, it is in the adjusting of the kilohertz range? on how to go about isolating um, leaks in the HVAC duct? That's another question. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So the signal generators will allow you to pick a frequency range that you're going to emit. Uh, just make sure that the II900 is set to the same frequency range, and then you'll be visualizing the, the sounds uh, within that range. Uh, I agree. Yeah, uh, uh, a tone generator would be uh, a cool addition. I will definitely pass that along to to the product team, and um, I'm, I'm sure they've I'm sure they've gotten that before. Um, I don't know why, uh, but it's a good a good question, and I look forward to hearing uh, what conversations have already been had on that. Perfect. A reminder: if you do have any questions, while we do have uh, about a minute or two left on here, please type them in. Uh, if you don't get a chance to answer uh, to get your question asked or answered here. As mentioned, uh, you can email all your questions uh, to information at itm.com. Our customer service team and our sales reps will answer any and all that do come in. Uh, there will be a follow-up email that goes out at the end of this uh, end of this webinar as well, um, as well as a survey. Uh, also, please note, I was asked to, rem uh, to remind this, uh, that the contest winner will be announced uh, after the webinar is over and concluded on our social media 
uh, pages. So look out for there for our contest winner. And let's see anything here uh, for a question for vermin control. I have never heard of that one. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, maybe rent one to, to test that out. Uh, I think it's I think it's an interesting an interesting thought. I have definitely seen um, people using thermal imaging technology for for vermin control. Um, but sound technology, that would be a new one. So go be a pioneer and definitely share share with us uh, what you learned. <laughs> All right, uh, looks like, oh, so last question and we'll wrap things up. A leakage in a nitrogen tent or nitrogen tents. Yeah, I have, a, I have an example image of that. Um, so it wasn't able to it wasn't able to pinpoint where the leak was coming from because the the nitrogen take was was under the tent um, but we did see one we did see one kind of escaping through the bottom of a tent uh, on a seam so uh, i have i have seen i have seen that work and you did see the example um, of a nitrogen leak uh, in in some of those application images so so yes i have i have seen that work perfect well, Adam, thank you very much for the presentation. It was a, extremely informative. Thank you everyone for attending uh, ITM University's webinar on ac acoustic sound imaging. Um, as a reminder, any and all questions uh, that you have from here on out, please email us at information at itm.com. That could be about pricing, availability, rental unit, anything that you can think of. Uh, if need be, we'll get in touch with Adam or uh, representative from Fluke to answer any and all technical questions that come in. Uh, another reminder, the contest winner will be announced on our social media pages, so please take a look out for there. Um, and also, a survey will be sent out uh, in a few short minutes once the webinar has been concluded. If you could take a minute, uh, fill it out, give us any topics that you might be interested in uh, ITM uni University covering, it, covering in the future. It would be great. Uh, we look forward to putting on a lot more of these webinars. So thank you again, everyone, for attending today. Thank you, Adam, very much for the uh, informative presentation. I will wish you all a great and safe rest of the day and week. Right on. Thanks, Chris.